Our, our next speaker is Gary Christensen, who has brought his family along, I think. Um, <laughs> and he's going to be talking about uh, lung image registration and analysis. And um, the, the last time I chaired a, um, a meeting, the, 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 the final speaker of the session started singing along with Gary um, <laughs> and a number of other people. So I'm kind of hoping that's not going to happen. Or well, maybe it'd be good if it did happen tonight. Um, yeah. So that was, just, that was just last Friday, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Great. Thanks for the introduction. Okay, so last talk of the fourth day. Perfect, because I get to draw on all the previous talks, and so everybody should get out some paper. There's going to be a pop quiz. So we're going to go back like at school, right? So we're going to have a pop quiz, and so I'm going to cite a lot of the previous talks in my talk right now, and so I just want you to think about what they've done, and so anyway, and then we're going to get to the middle of my talk. It's going to be very mathematical, and again, in order to stay awake on this last day and everything, you kind of have to keep these pictures in your mind so you keep um, up with everything, and so I'm going to do my best to try to teach you about a really complicated item. So, okay, so here's the outline of my talk. I'm going to talk about why lung registration is important. So I'm going to uh, talk about a couple applications right there. And then I'm going to talk about um, three different um, cost functions. And so I'm going to stop short on each one of these. But basically, these are going to be similarity functions for image registration, specifically customized towards the lung registration problem. And so um, the middle one, the currents, is going to take the longest time. It's pretty in depth. And so we'll, we'll get on to that. And then finally, just very briefly at the very end, I'm going to show you how we can use the registration algorithms, um, the results of transformations to do a mechanical analysis on the lungs. OK. So the first application that we want to uh, use lung registration for is to understand the regional lung function and mechanical properties of the lung. OK, so if we can do that, we can track disease. We can see if treatment's working and everything. And so for instance, disease changes the function of the lung. So if we um, look at somebody that's been smoking a lot, they have uh, chronic uh, 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 obstructive pulmonary disease, emphysema. Basically, that gives the lung increased compliance. That means it's more stretchy, all right? So it's elastic, it's, it's more stretchy. On the other end of things, we can have pulmonary fibrosis, and that's decreased compliance, so it's not as stretchy. And so basically, these um, um, different things are going to affect different parts of the lung. And so the, the whole part, part right here is in order to uh, find where those regional differences are. And so that's, that's the first application. The second application is cancer. Okay, so a lot of uh, people die every year uh, of cancer, and nearly a quarter of the people in the United States die from lung cancer. And most of these cases are the non-small cell lung carcinomas. And unfortunately, these are really hard to operate on because of their size or their location. And so the, the treatment that we use is uh, radiotherapy and chemotherapy. And so if we take a look at this, okay, here's a, a treatment plan right here. So the tumor's down here, so we've got the tumor highlighted in green, and then these isodose curves are around here, and they tell you how much dose or how much treatment that we're, we're given to the tumor. Okay, so the, the goal is to give 60 gray to the tumor, but we don't do that all at once. What we do is we break it up into small fractions every day, about two gray per day, and so, um, so over the course of six to seven weeks, we, we treat the full tumor and everything, and so what we'll see on the next slide is this is what happens over the course of treatment. We start out before treatment, the doctors delineate where the, the tumor boundaries are, but then after treatment, due to chemotherapy and radiotherapy, the tumor shrinks. So sometimes the tumor can shrink up to 80%. So the, the problem with using your original plan on the last day is you're radiating all this normal tissue around here. And so what we would like to do is be able to adapt our radiotherapy plan to make it tighter around the, the tumor. Okay, so, um, so basically on average, the tumor shrinks about 44% over this six or seven uh, uh, week period, and that works out to be about 0.6 to 2.4% per day. Okay, and so um, this is really bad. If you irradiate normal tissue, basically this high dose is gonna kill whatever it does. That, that, that's what we're trying to do to the tumor is kill it, but we really wanna keep normal um, lung uh, functioning and everything. We don't wanna make more problems than what we're trying to solve. Okay, so here's the idea. We want to modify our treatment plan with respect to the, our observed changes in what's going on. So, so maybe we're, we're tracking the tumor regression. How's the tumor shrinking over the course of this treatment? 
Maybe it's delivered dose. Maybe there's a part of the normal tissue that's got too much dose and we want to minimize how much dose that's getting. So we might want to adjust what we've planned on the first day, like mid-course or something like that. Or maybe there's some deformation that happens, such as one of the lo lobes of the lung collapse due to atelectasis and then it pops open. So often this happens um, because that's just what happens. The tumor grows, it cuts off the air to that lobe. Once it starts shrinking, it opens up the, the airway. All of a sudden, it just pops open, okay? So it's a big deformation, okay? So, so basically, we want to basically, most of the time, reduce the treatment field according to the observed change because things are getting smaller, okay? So that means we're going to increase the sparing of the normal tissue, like don't kill it, um, enable dose escalation of the tumor. So if we know exactly where the tumor is, then we can give it even more dose, right? So we don't care if we overdose the tumor, okay? And then finally, we hope that this gives improved outcomes. I mean, that, that's the overall goal. Okay, so this shows you what happens if we do a bad job of registration. So you see this is the sort of the um, dose plan that we have, and if this is, the red region shows the high uh, dose region, and then it's a very steep fall off, and then you have to radiate the whole uh, body. Basically, the way this works is you've got a bunch of beams coming in from different directions, and where they overlap is this red region in the middle up here, and we try to make it as steep of a fall off as possible. So you want to deliver the dose to the tumor, but then spare all the normal tissue. Well, you can see as soon as we're off by a little bit on our registration, we're giving a really high dose to normal tissue. So anyway, we want to have really accurate uh, registration, and ideally we would like this to, to track with the lung, because the lung breathes, I mean, it moves during the, the breathing operation, and so the tighter we can get this, the more we can spare the normal tissue. Okay, so just real briefly, Yozine gave a great introduction to, to image registration, plus we've seen uh, other talks um, this week talking about image registration, so just real quickly, here's a, a flow chart, very simple of how we do image registration. We start with two uh, images, the target image and the source image, and what we want to do is change the source image so it looks like the target. Okay, so we do this iteratively, we go around the loop over here, and there's some similarity metric up here that tells us how similar the two shapes are. Okay, whether shape, intensity, and everything like that. And then we go through, oops, all right. We go through this and we keep iterating, iterating until maybe the source image looks like the, the original one, and we have a nice properties on the transformation. So the output of this process is, is a transformation, which I've illustrated with this uh, grid. So if we start with this full uh, inspiration, so the lung's really small, and we want to map it to this full expiration, so our inspiration, so you breathe in, the lungs get bigger like this. So it's a very difficult registration problem right here. And so what I'm trying to illustrate with the deformed grid is the transformation, and so that's what we're trying to capture in this. Okay, so today's talk, instead of talking about all these different boxes, I'm just going to focus on the similarity metric. So what I did is I, I said, what are the, like the, the main techniques that people are using nowadays? Um, and so I picked three of them that I thought were really interesting, and so that's what I want to teach you about today. Okay, so the first um, similarity cost is intensity-based, and so we've heard about this uh, before, so like a sum of squares, intensity difference. So this, this is the simplest of all simple, the same modality, you take one image, take a second image, subtract it, you square the intensity differences, and that's the uh, single modality. Sandy Wells, uh, a couple days ago, talked about mutual information, and so we want to minimize the mutual information. So he showed in his talk, when you get two things lined up, that the joint histogram became uh, less scattered and everything. And then, so today, I'm going to talk about these two right here, the sum of squared tissue volumes, and it's also referred to as mass-preserving image registration. When we do, what I'll show you in the next slides and everything is when we deform the, the lung, the thing that changes is the air. The tissue doesn't. And so the idea behind this method right here is to track the tissue over the deformation and then let the air do what it's going to do. And then the sum of squared vesselness just says, if I can do good with the, the intensity, I want to add additional features like vessels, and the more information I can add to my registration, the better it goes. Okay, so that, this is the first class, the, the intensity-based. So following along that same theme of adding more and more information, um, we're going to look at how um, to add curves and surfaces using a technique called currents. Okay, so this is going to be the major portion of my talk because, again, it's really important. You'll start to hear this in the image registration literature. At first glance, it's not entirely obvious, but it's very powerful 
You don't have to define correspondences between surfaces. Uh, you don't have to define correspondences between lines, and so we'll, we'll talk about that next. Then finally, I'm going to talk about the 40 nature of this problem. So we have a breathing lung, and so we can't just be satisfied with registering two three-dimensional three volumes. We need to be able to register the whole breathing phase, because what we want to do eventually is get the dynamics of the lung. So not just how things expanded from total inspiration to total inspiration expiration and inspiration, we want to get the, the dynamic signature. Okay, so, so anyway, my talk is going to get, just going to get to a point, and it's going to stop, it's going to start over, do the next one, stop, and so I just don't have time to go through all the details, but hopefully we can get into the, de the depths of each one of these methods, and I hope you learned something about that. So these are the ones I'm going to concentrate on in the talk. Okay, so the first one I'm going to talk about is image registration using mass preserving. Um, image registration. And so these two groups, the, a group from Iowa and a group from um, Marlene's group, um, so Marlene's right here, so from Copenhagen, they basically jointly developed this um, technique, even though the papers are offset by a couple years, like in the conferences and everything, they basically came up with the same idea independently about the same time. So I'm giving credit to both of these groups for coming up with this, this technique. Okay, and so now let's take a look at the, the picture over here. This is a picture of a sheep lung that we have on a ventilator. And what you see is the CT values inside the lungs get darker as the, uh, the lung expands. And what's happening there is we have the same amount of tissue, the same number amount of curcumin in, in the lungs, but the air is changing. And so this black around the outside, whenever you image air, it's black. And so that's what's happening right here. So when we try to measure correspondence between two lung images, we need to take into account this change of intensity. And so that's what I'm going to drive for you in the next couple slides. And so this similarity criteria is called the sum of squared tissue volume differences. So the thing that doesn't change from, uh, from uh, inspiration to expiration is the amount of tissue. So there's about a 3.5% change in the tissue. So that's pretty much constant. And so that's what we're going to drive our, our transformation on. Okay. So the idea behind this method is we have a voxel of tissue that is comprised both of air and of tissue, okay? And as it deforms, we're going to get more air and the, the amount of tissue is going to stay the same. Okay, so we'll start with this little v. This is going to be the, the volume of a voxel, and I is going to be the Hounsfield unit of our CT image. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide this voxel into a, a tissue volume and an air volume, and if we, you add those two up, you get the whole voxel volume and everything. So that, that's the idea. Okay, so little v is our, our volume of a, of a voxel. And then this is just a, a simple gray map uh, scaling of the image, which Eric Hoffman came up in this paper down here. So it's been around for quite a long time. But what it says to do is if you take your Hounsfield unit, subtract out air, and then normalize by the difference of the, the tissue minus the, the Hounsfield unit of the air, then you can take it from a, a Hounsfield unit into a tissue volume. So this, this beta function right here is basically what I'm going to be calling my, my tissue volume, and it's just um, multiplied by the volume of a voxel. And then to get the air volume over here, it's, it's basically the same equation such that it adds up to 1. So we want this condition right here. So the air volume image and the tissue volume image, they all add up to 1 and 1 voxel. But again, I can't control how much air is going in the lungs, so I'm just going to concentrate on the tissue volume. I want to match the tissue volume from one image to the next. Okay, so here's a transformation. I have my template voxel and my target voxel, and I have some transformation that um, projects the template into the target space. And so the cost function here oops, for the sum of squared tissue volumes just adds up all the voxels in the target, that's V2, and then all the deformed voxels in the template, and we just sum them up. So that's where we get the name, uh, sum of squared tissue volumes. Okay, so now from the previous slide, um, we can write this in terms of the, the volume of the voxels times the tissue volume, and then on the, the template, we have to deform that voxel volume. And so there's a straightforward um, way to do that. You basically just take your transform voxel and you just multiply it by the determinant of the Jacobian, and now you get the, the, vo the volume of the voxel in your target coordinate system. If we take the limit as the voxels get really, really small, we can write this as an integral, integral equation, and this is exactly the same equation in both uh, papers, and so if I just go back a slide, I forgot much. 
So the only difference between what you'll see in the two journal papers is whether this 55 is zero or 55. So I mean, the methods are identical, even, even though they're described just a little bit different. Okay, so obviously when we implement it, we'll probably be using the discrete equation, but it's nice to, to go back both ways so we can uh, see what's going on. Okay, so now I talked about adding additional features to the registration. So it turns out that just looking at the sum of tissue volume squared differences isn't enough. And so what we did is we added this vesselness. Oh, my slides are kind of out of order. Okay, so we added this vesselness uh, metric right here based on the, the Frangi vesselness filter. Okay, basically it looks at the eigenvalues of the Hessian matrix. And so now if you apply this uh, technique to the lung image over here, basically you're able to find tubular structures in the image. So this, when, I'm always showing you 2D images, but think about these as being 3D volumes. Okay, so we want tubular structures. So if I have an isotropic structure and I take the Hessian, which is just the second derivatives like in the X, Y, Z, X, Y, Y, Z, like all those, I take the uh, singular value decomposition of that to get my eigenvectors. If I have an isotropic structure, basically all three eigenvectors are exactly the same and, and so I don't want those. What I want is a tubular structure. In this case, one of the eigenvectors is negligible and the other ones are not. Seems a little counterintuitive but until you think about doing this on an image. And so on the image over here, if you take, so like this example right here, if I take the derivative in the x direction right there, that's the direction of the, the tubular structure. What's, the, what's that? That's zero, right? There's no derivative in that direction. You get all the derivatives perpendicular. So I'm gonna get a perpendicular in the y direction and the z direction. That's how you can understand this um, one eigenvalue being zero, the other one not being zero. Okay, so now this is Frangi's vesselness filter. And basically, if we have a, a bright object on a, back, on a dark background, all the eigenvalues are gonna be negative. Okay, so we're gonna order these from smallest to largest in magnitude. And then this, hopefully this is familiar to you. If not, this is a great thing to learn about. I mean, people use it all, all the time. Okay, so it's, it's made up of three terms right here. The first term up here basically is a ratio of the two largest eigenvalues. And so that's kind of looking at how round the tubular structure is. So if it's really round, then this term is gonna go to zero and the whole parentheses is gonna be one, okay? This term over here, they fra phrase as the blob-like structure, so if it's an isotropic type of structure. In this case, the, all the, the three eigenvalues are gonna be about the same size, and then this is gonna be a, a small value right here, so it brings the, the vesselness filter down. If we have this one negligible eigenvalue, it's zero, and then this just becomes one. So we're, we're looking for tubular structures, and so this is the thing that's kind of taken into account, this right here. And then finally, this term over here is basically the, the Frobenius for, for norm of the, of the Hessian matrix. And basically, it just says that we have strong signals inside the lung and it's all noise outside. So basically, it's, it's making sure you only get signals inside the, the lung where you actually have the tubular structures. Okay, so we apply the, this Frangi vesselness uh, filter to our uh, CT images and this is the output we get. And then we just use that as another image into our registration, and so I'll just call this F1 and F2 for the, the vesselness. I don't know why we, my student took, chose F, but she did. <laughs> v seems so much more appropriate. But anyway, that's what we have right there. And then finally, the next thing we did was uh, uh, add a regularization to it. And so basically, we just added one more term that um, basically penalizes any rough transformation. So if you have a smooth transformation, we want the simplest transformation to describe the motion. And so basically what you can do right here with this regularization term is U is our displacement field and L is a differential operator. And so basically if you take large derivatives, you're gonna have a high cost. So the higher the derivatives of your displacement field, the higher the cost. Um, so if you're seeing the vesselness, uh, the scale factor of vesselness, you have inspiration and inspiration, that's it. So yeah. uh, that's gonna change, right? Or uh, wouldn't the vessels, because of the air, that's an excellent question. Um, so the question was, um, when we have inspiration and expiration, do the vessels change in diameter? And the answer is no. The airways change, but the vessels pretty much stay constant. And I'll show you that um, in a, a slide or two. And so it, that, that's why the vessels are such a good landmark to, 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 to register on, because they don't expand with the air. So like the airways get bigger and everything, but the vessels pretty much stay about the same size all throughout. Are you talking about the vessel walls or? 
the whole tube, the whole tube, yeah. Yeah. Um, along the same lines, does the curvature change at all? Because of lights? Actually, I, I can't answer that. I, I haven't looked into that yet, but I mean, that, that's where we're going. And we'll see that with the currents. We'll actually be able to start answering questions like that when we get to like a parameterized model of what, what it looks like. So, good questions. Okay, so now we're just gonna finish up here with the, the first cost function. This is the image-based cost function. So it, it's, it comprises of the mass reserving term, the sum of squared differences, the, the vessels, and then this regularization term over here. Okay, so just real quick, this is a uh, quick validation. We're using exactly what we just heard in the last talk. So we're actually using Keeling's uh, program to do the, the landmarks. So we get about 150 landmarks right here. And so if we just use the sum of square tissue volume, we get the result on the left over here. And so we got the red and green dots. If things are perfect, they'd be right on top of each other. But what you see is the sum of square tissue volumes kind of fails at the diaphragm. That's where the lungs are moving the most. It's moving up and down um, right over there. But now if you add additional information, such as the vesselness, it doesn't do a whole lot, but it does get um, the landmarks better. So, so sometimes you've got to add a lot more information to your um, registration just to get the last 10% or something like that. So it looks like we still need to, to do a little bit better. And you couldn't just use the vesselness all by itself because it would get stuck in local minima. So again, we sort of had this multi-resolution approach by using the image intensities with the SSTVD and then um, cleaning it up with the vesselness. Here's another way to see the same result. Basically, on the left column right here, we've run the experiment with three different cost functions, sum of squared differences, mutual information, and SSTVD. And what, what I'm showing right here is the vessel tree, and these colors down here show where the mismatches are. So there's just the closest distance uh, between the vessel trees, and you see that most of the error happens right at the diaphragm. But now when we add additional information, such as the vesselness, then you see that it, it gets a, a very good registration of the vessel tree. And one last example to show you why the vesselness helps so much is, so, so this is FRC, functional residual capacity. We want to register this to total lung capacity, so uh, expiration and inspiration. And I, I have, hopefully everybody can see the red line up here, that's the fissure. So the lungs divided into the five different lobes and they slide across these, these lobes and everything. And so we really want to get, if we have a good registration, those lo lobes better match one to the, the other. So if we just use the SSTVD in this particular case, this doesn't always happen. So again, these are examples where the vessel is gonna help. We really have a, a poor registration. So this vessel, I mean, this fissure should have continued on up, but when we add the vesselness, then the vessel trees match up, and then we actually get the lobes matching the lobes. Okay, so, so any questions on this first part? So this is like using a, an image intensity type of cost function. Yep. Well, that, that's what the landmarks were, were telling us. So, I mean, we, we can see that the landmark error is going down. I took those slides out for, for time. It could be, but I, I think what we're seeing, right? Yeah, so this is, yeah. All right, so the question was, um, maybe this is still the optimum for the, the mass preserving uh, registration as well, and that's totally true. The trouble is we can get stuck in a lot of local minima, and so the more features we have, we can jump out of a local minima, and that's exactly what happened here. So you're, you're totally right. This, this would be a lower cost than the, no, it is, because I mean, things are, are lined up better, so very good comment. Okay, yeah. Yeah, it, it could, yeah. Um, just on your last slide, you showed the vessel. You, yeah. Is that what you were using for registers? No. So you might fresh off and you're just using the vessel. Yeah, just the vessel and this, and then, yeah, I was supposed to give you a call out. So anyway, we saw how to make these vessel trees in uh, Marlene's talk uh, yesterday and everything. So, all right, so again, with the pop quiz, yeah. Um, so you had different, I guess, parts that fed into the objective function. Yep. Yeah, so the first thing to mention, that this is the same person, so it's, it's over the breathing cycle and everything, so the scale, is, it should be the same, and so basically we just tune the 
um, the Gaussian weights and everything to, to try to get the best feature size. So w whatever the scale was of that, we, we adjusted by hand what that. Uh, okay, so you just adjust by hand, you're know, like in health, A1, A2, or 3 of weighting. Yeah, and once we find it, it's very stable. So it, it doesn't change very much when we do it, but we kind of look at the output image and kind of see if it makes sense. If it's too broad, or sometimes if you make the Gaussian too, too small, you just get the walls instead of the, the whole thing. So we're actually trying to find the Gaussian such that we get a, a continuous response, one response for the whole vessel right there. Yeah, and then it's done. We use the same thing. Yeah. So we have a better version of vesselness. Yeah. So, yeah. Yep. Yep. So, exactly. So, cool. So we'll talk later and, and get that. So, all right. All right. So the next part of the talk is the the talk about the difficult stuff right here. So I really like this method. It's called uh, currents. And so basically, this is a, a generalized way to represent surfaces and curve type structures. So even though I'm going to talk about it in, in the case of lungs today, it works on any other type of tubular or surface structure in the body, okay? And so, so basically I'm calling out Lina's work, and again Marlene's part of this, and then Stanley Durlman's thesis, and then we have Alan Tuve in the back, and so this is his work, so Stanley was his, his student up there, so I wanted to give you a shout out there too. So. Okay, so in 2005, uh, 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 oh <laughs> what's his name, Yon? Yuan, okay, yeah, I'll also know blank. Yohan Glennis and Mark Valiant introduced uh, the idea of currents at ITME 2005, okay, and then basically the cool thing about this, this idea is the similarity metric uh, doesn't assume point-wise correspondence, so it actually kind of weights it, and we'll see that as we come up, and so what they did is they proposed using a framework of reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces, which we'll go into in, in just a second, and that makes this, this whole idea tractable. So let's just start with a simple question. How do I represent a, a curve on the computer? So some people um, use points and line segments. Okay, some people add tangent to this. Okay, so maybe that's a good thing, maybe it's not so good. Okay, but what about defining correspondence? Do I have to do the same thing? Do I, do I need to have point correspondences between this? So like a lot of people in a very simple case would just have the same number of points between the curves and you would just define the correspondences uh, between this. But what if we have a different number of points between the different curves? I mean, it just, where do we start and all this stuff? And so one possible solution to this, this problem is to use currents, okay? Currents don't assume uh, correspondence between curves. So, so the beautiful thing is I can have a different number of uh, landmarks in one curve versus the other. It doesn't affect anything. Then if you think about surfaces, it gets even more mind-boggling that you can actually um, have all kinds of problems with that. And another cool thing about currents is you can actually combine multiple lines into a single line current. Yeah, so we'll see that in just a second. Okay, so, but what the heck is a current? <laughs> that's, the, that's what I hope you come out of my talk learning today is what a current is. So that, that's my goal right now is to teach you what a current is. Okay, so this is right out of Stanley Durman's thesis and the first time you read this, it's a bit confusing. So I wanna break it down so you can understand it. What he says is a current of a, a curve L is defined as the path integral of the vector field omega along the curve L, and it's given by this equation right here, okay, where T is the tangent to the line at the point X, and D, D lambda is just the Lebesgue measure um, on the curve. Okay, so, you got it? No. <laughs> All right. So, you may need to read it a bunch of times, but let, let's see if we can make it a little bit simpler for you to understand. So what I want you to do is just focus on this L right here. And so what I want you to do is, is focus on this and think of this as the current. Okay, this is the object that we're gonna call a current and it's acting on this vector field omega, okay? Then we have an abusive notation in this, this equation up here. This is a different L, okay? So, so anyway, this L corresponds to the, the line in your ambient space. This L over here corresponds to your current. So that's, that's part of the confusion of reading this this definition first, okay, but just go with it, all right? Let's, you'll have to rewrite all the literature, it's gonna be a mess, so you just have to learn about this abuse of notation. Mathematicians love abuse of notation, so uh, just get used to it. All right, so anyway, what this is, is saying up here is given any vector field of a certain class, we'll get into that in just a second, I can operate on L, 
And what, what this is, is it's gonna give me a number. Okay, so it's a linear function of vector fields. And so basically, this number that I get out here, when I apply a current to a vector field, is defined by this integral over here. And now this, this integral has is, is got a certain form that's really beautiful. Basically, it's a line integral along the curve, and you have the tangents along the curve. So basically, I've encoded everything about a, a line into this function right up here. And so I can just apply this function to any vector field, and it'll give me a number. Okay, so again, I'm gonna repeat this because it's not at the first blanch, or first observation entirely obvious. Okay, so now we have the vessel tree, and again, we've learned how to, to get the vessel tree out of the data and everything, and so these are center lines up here, and notice there's more than one line. Okay, so basically, each one of these lines can be represented as a current, and then I can add those currents up together in a formal sum, and then I can have one equation up here, one current that describes this whole vascular tree, and then I can take one vascular tree from one image to another one, and then we can do this correspondence without having to have landmark uh, correspondences. So I can have different number of branches in one versus the other. I can have different points. And so what I've blown up right here, which is really hard to see, is along each one of these branches, there's a point and there's a tangent vector. Okay, so what I'm gonna talk to you about is how to take this continuous equation and then break it up into a discrete basis. And so we can actually discretize this infinite dimensional current up here into a finite sum of uh, point currents. Okay, so we can do the same thing for um, the surface. So again, we're gonna play the same game, same abuse of notation. So again, when we look at surfaces, this S right here is the object I want you to think of as the, the current. It's not the whole function, it's this thing S over here. And S is operating on a smooth vector field. When you take something S and a vector field together, you get a real number out. The real number is defined over here. So again, the two S's are not the same. And now I've encoded the whole surface in this equation up here. So this is my surface. This is the normal at each point along the surface. Okay, I integrate this up. And the way to think about this is it captures how much flux flows through the surface at any one point, and it gives you a number out. Okay, so here's an example of how we're gonna use it. We have a triangulated surface up here, and each one of these triangles is gonna be represented in a minute by a, 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 a delta current and, I mean, a, a direct current, and basically it's got a normal to it, and we're gonna sum up all the contributions from this, and so it's gonna take us a second to get there. Okay, so first we need to learn about what a reproducing Colonel Hilbert space is, and I'm gonna do my best, but today. Yeah. Just, okay, I get the surface, I get the dimension of normal. Yep. What does the vector field represent? Well, that's what we're gonna get into right now. So what I'm gonna describe right now is the set of vector fields. That, that's what this, this slide is about. So if you hang with me until we get to the bottom of the slide, then we can ask the question if it hasn't been answered. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna try to simplify this down. So like if you, you read the literature, you're gonna see a bunch of these things. But what I'm trying to do right now is I want you to have in your mind, it's just a Gaussian filter, or, or a Gaussian kernel, sorry. Okay, so basically whenever you see this, I'm gonna show you a picture in a second, and I want you to visualize that through the rest of the, of the talk. But basically what this is, is you take the distance between two points, and you just put in this Gaussian function, You've got some variance of some smoothing of the, the, the bell curve, and then you have this identity matrix over here. So if it's in 3D, this is a, a three-dimensional identity matrix. Okay, so now the reproducing Colonel Hilbert space, this is gonna be the class of vector fields that we're gonna look at. In, in turn, that class of vector fields is gonna induce a, a type of current over here. So this reproducing Colonel Hilbert space is a set of vector fields with certain properties. Okay, the first one is it's a closed span of vector fields of the form like this. So when I see K times beta, what do you think of? The Gaussian, all right? So we're gonna see this all over the talk and everything. So K times beta is the Gaussian, okay? And then we're gonna define this pair Y and, and beta as a momentum. And so the best way to look at this is just through an example. Okay, so Y is fixed. So y is a point right here in my example, five, five, okay? And beta is a, you can think of it as a tangent vector or a momentum vector. I'm not really sure what, what the, the proper way to, to describe what beta is, but it's a, it's a vector. And what happens with the smoothing function is basically you take the vector beta, which is right here in the middle at five, five, and you smooth it with the Gaussian, okay? So the, this, 
this kernel operation basically takes that one vector and spreads it out over space, and now I can choose um, different um, weightings and everything, and that's going to give me a different uh, reproducing kernel Hilbert space. So it's going to, so it's, it's all important. So once you set your, your smoothing, that's going to set the, the properties of this reproducing kernel Hilbert space. So I can't change it. So you pick one, it's fixed, and then I'm going to have objects like this in my reproducing kernel Hilbert space. And so basically think about this as a basis function. So I can take these and place them any place in the space over here, add them up, and what this word close means is as I take the limit, all the limit points are contained in the space. So I can have infinite sums of these basis functions. So another example. So since it's a basis, I can add up multiple basis functions together. And so I've taken four momenta over here. Each momenta represents a different basis function. Basis is a smooth vector field. And I just add these up. And so you see one, one basis vector field over here, another one over here, another one over here. So I can continue to do this to make really complicated vector fields. And they're all smooth. They're guaranteed to be smooth by my, my kernel function up here. And as I change lambda, I'm going to get more focused or more broad uh, vector fields. And so it just depends on your, your application, how you choose that. OK. So now the second property of the reproducing kernel Hilbert space is you, it's endowed with an inner product. And so again, when you see k times alpha, it's a smooth vector field. And then I have another smooth vector field. So this inner product takes two smooth vector fields. And these are the basis functions. And then it, it gives me a really s nice closed form solution how to get my number, right? If you take the inner product of anything, it gives you one number out, right? OK, so another example. OK, so here's my smooth vector field over here. So I have my alpha vector. It's 1, 2. I've got my Gaussian. Then my second smooth vector field, I've got a vector 3, 0. And then this is centered at y. So y is at location 7, 8. x is at 5, 6. When I take the inner product, basically, I just take the dot product of the two vectors, multiply it by this Gaussian. And this is the way to think about this. It's basically you take the point x and the point y, you just take the difference. And so the way to interpret this is the further the, the two momentum away, the less influence they have on each other. So if they're right on top of each other, it's a big inner product. If they're far apart, basically this Gaussian is going to say they don't have any inter interaction. And then the second part of this inner product is the, the two tangent vectors. If they're, they're going in the same direction, you're going to have a big response. If they're orthogonal to each other, it's a low response too. So basically, there's two ways to make this inner product go to 0. OK, and then finally, we have the re reproducing kernel uh, property right here. And so basically, if I look at this equation, which hopefully you guys were happy with, right? Smooth vector field, smooth vector field number. I replace this one with just a, an arbitrary uh, smooth vector field from this class. So I replace this, and I just take omega in here. And then I do the same to the right-hand side. So basically, what this does is it says I can evaluate my vector field at x times this, this vector right here by taking the inner product with, with the basis kernel and my, my vector field, my smooth vector field right here. Yeah. Uh, so I got to the bottom of the slide. He's still got a question. Right, this property works only if you uh, allow them to the same scale. Yeah. So all of this, so once we pick that one Gaussian uh, smoothing kernel, that sets my reproducing kernel Hilbert space. So I can't change that. So it's fixed. I need to, to take that. And all these. So you can get the, uh, these fields arbitrary size, arbitrary size. Well, I can make w smaller if I wanted to. But, but I can't. But fixed. Yeah, but fixed. Yep. OK. So anyway, that's the reproducing uh, property right there. And so, I'm, so I, I need to summarize, because there's so many steps in this. So what we have at this point is we have our space of test vector fields. And basically, we have a basis with smooth vector fields. So they're located at y, and they, they have magnitude and direction alpha, and we have an inner product. The next step we're trying to do is do the same. So we want to describe the space of currents. So that's the dual space. All right, so you've, you've probably heard this over and over again. And so somehow we got to take our smooth vector fields. We're going to go through this function L into the, the dual space, and now we're going to get our functionals, right? Thinking back to our original slides when we looked at the current the curves and the surfaces. So that's, that's the goal of the next section right here. So the Reitz representation theorem ensures that we have a, a linear mapping between our reproducing kernel Hilbert space W and its dual space W star. This is where the currents live. So W star is the space of currents. And so basically, we're going to take our representation of lines and surfaces 
into the dual space. We're going to work on everything in the dual space, but everything's defined in the first space, so we'll have to pull it back. Okay, so this mapping is defined with this, this following equation right here. And so again, this is one of those definitions you've got to read over and over again to, to get, so let, let's simplify things. Let's break it out. So what it's saying is this, this mapping L takes me from W to W star. So this is a mapping from my reproducing kernel Hilbert space of smooth functions to my uh, space occurrence, the dual space. So if you look at just this part right here, this is what I have circled as the, the current. All right, so this is the object in the dual space. So we're going to call that the current. It's an element of the dual space. It maps a smooth vector field to the, the dual space. So it's going to take a smooth vector field and it's going to make it into one of these linear operators. Okay? And then, then it operates on omega prime. So basically you have the thing in, in yellow right there is an operator. It operates on a smooth vector field. And what do we get when we have an operator in a smooth, op smooth vector field? Another number. Okay, so the number is defined by this inner product again. Okay? So I just summarized what I said in the yellow in this line right here. Okay, so now what we can think of, this is a, we're going to give a name to that object that's in the dual space. So basically, when you see K alpha, what, what do you think of? A smooth vector field, right? Now we have this function L. What does L do? It takes a smooth vector field from my W space to my dual space. And the objects in the dual space are currents. And so I'm going to define this delta function right here as my delta direct, uh, or direct, direct delta currents. I always say it backwards. <laughs> All right, so if I say delta direct, this, this, okay. So anyway, this is the object. This is my operator. And so it's going to turn out that this is the dual space. So I start with a smooth vector field, and then I get a, um, a current over here. So I'm going to have to speed up because we're running out of time, <laughs> unfortunately. Okay, but anyway, since it's an operator, I can operate on a, um, a smooth vector field. And now the reason why I've got such a, a noisy slide right here is I'm just going to use my definitions. So what is the direct delta current? It's this mapping the smooth vector field by L. So I'm just going to take this and substitute where I have the delta and put it right here. So this is acting on omega. Then we're going to go up to our definition of what L does. L says take a smooth vector field, map it to the dual space, and operate on a another smooth vector field. So here's my first smooth vector field. There's my second one. So just using this definition, I put it in the inner product. And then we just, and then if we do this um, from the previous slide with the reproducing property, we get this just very simple formula. We take alpha times the, the smooth vector field evaluated at x. All right, so we'll use that in just a second. Sorry, this is just a lot of mechanics to get. We're still working on how to measure, register one vessel tree with another vessel tree, just to remind you <laughs> what the goal is here. Okay. Ah. <laughs> okay, so, we, so in W, we have smooth vector fields as our bases, and now we have delta currents as our bases in the dual space. So basically, um, what this says is since the Smooth vector fields span W, so do the delta direct functions, they span W star. And so what this means is any current may be decomposed into an infinite set of direct currents. And so that's what I'm showing right here. So basically, I can come up with a much more complicated structure. So if you think of T as the vector field, I mean, sorry, as the vessel tree, I can like now have all the little line segments represented by a, a separate um, delta uh, direct current up here, which has a direction and a location. Okay, and then I can sum these up so I can just keep adding up one line to another line to another line. So this can be a very complex thing over here. Okay, so again, where we are, and so we still have to fill in this, but anyway. <laughs> okay, so we've got our, our basis function in both cases, and so this is how we apply it. This is my original um, current. Remember, L was the current acting on, on W. We just saw that we could replace this integral with a finite summation of direct currents, and then we saw how the direct currents operated on smooth vector fields to give us this number over here. Okay, so, so anyway, this is how we discretize this, this current into something that's, that's doable, because this is just the summation of inner products. Same thing happens for the, the surfaces. I just sum up these uh, uh, direct currents, and then it operates on omega, the vector field, and basically it just evaluates the vector field at x, and you inner product with the normal of the surface. Okay.
So the next step is to get an inner product. So I want to find out what the inner product of two currents are. Okay. So, so basically we have this, we define this reproducing kernel space of um, test vector fields. And now we have the function L, and we can actually take this inner product, map it to the dual space. So that's what we're going to do right here. So it says if I have two currents, T and T prime, and I want to find the inner product in the dual space, the way to do that is the following. I have to pull back each current back from W star back into W. So that's what L inverse is doing. It's pulling those back. And then once I pull it back into that space, now I can use the inner product that was defined previously. Okay, so this is, we're getting there. We're almost to the point where we can measure the distance between two, two currents. Okay, so now we have this equation right here. So I'm just going to take you through it. So if I know how this inner product in the dual space works on the basis vectors, then I can just sum them up for the, um, for the, the more complicated things. So we pull them back. And then we just do the substitution right here that we get smooth vector fields, right? This inner product in our first space was just the inner product smooth vector fields. We had the definition of what that was. And again, it just comes out to be something really simple. It just takes the, the two vectors, dots them together, and then you take the, the Gaussian distance between them. So basically, it's just the further they are, the less this is. Then real quick, any current can be represented by a summation of these uh, direct currents. So if I want to find the inner product between two of these, I just substitute their equations in the inner product. The property of the inner product is linear, so I can take the summations out. Okay, so I'm just left with the inner product to two basis functions. And what's that? It's defined on the line right above it. So basically, I can just substitute this into my equation right there. Yep. So, uh, so I, I fully understand. So you begin with, uh, with the kernel. That exponential minus that. Yep. And actually, you are trying to construct uh, a space for which that thing is actually the inner product between, uh, between some representation of x and y in the other space. Yep, exactly. So we start with the reproducing kernel Hilbert space. It's got its own inner product. Now we're going to use that to define currents. So now I want to find an inner product in that current space, that dual space. Which corresponds to the expression you had in the Yep, okay. exactly. Yep, good. All right, so this is where we are at the moment. So we're there, almost there. Now we just have to find the norm of the, the distance of the two currents. So now, now we're finally at image registration. All right, we have to find our cost function. So if I have two uh, vessel trees and I want to find the distance between them, I just take the norm of their distances. And so on the last slide, we just saw how to take the, the, the norm in the dual space. And it's just the square root of the, the inner product. OK, so instead of working with the square roots, I'm just going to work with the, the square of the norm. And so I just stick this into the inner product. I can pull out all the terms over here. So each one of these are from the previous slide. And so we can just write down the summation. And so now this is really cool, because each one of these currents could have a different number of current, uh, direct delta currents in each one of them. OK, these expressions down here say just compare every single um, momentum vector, and you weight it by how far things are apart from each other. So basically, I can take that whole vessel tree and the other whole vessel tree. If I have two um, momentum that are close to each other, they have a big impact. If they're far, the Gaussian kernel says they have no impact on each other. So this is basically how we get at um, this correspondence free registration. It's all right here in this, this equation right here. And so, so maybe you'll just have to go back and look at it later. It's a lot to, to take in, in in one lecture. So now we're, we're done with everything we need. So I can finally explain what the cost function is using currents. Okay, so, so basically, we're going to have three terms up here. The first term is basically L1 minus L2. It, that, think of that as your vessel tree. And so L1 is your source. L2 is your target vessel tree. And then I have a, a a diffeomorphism, a transformation I'm going to apply to this set of currents. And I don't have another half hour or hour to explain how, to, how that operation works. Uh, but anyway, this is going to deform L1 into the, the shape of L2. And then we're going to have this, this norm in terms of the, just the line segments. OK, that's the over here. Then we're going to do the same thing for the surfaces. So the same transformation, OK, it deforms a surface to match here. And I just explained how to, to take the, that norm on the previous slide. And then finally, we have some regularization over here. And so again, part of the pop quiz. So if you think back to John's talk and, and Mike's talk, 
and everything. They talked about how to, to take a velocity field and integrate it to get a diffeomorphism. And so this uh, ODE describes the motion of the, the diffeomorphism. So it's a whole class of diffeomorphisms. And so at t equals zero is the identity. At t equals one, which I have up here, basically is the, the answer. Okay, so, so basically we're gonna constrain the velocity of our diffeomorphisms and so there's a whole lot more work to do. I just, like I said, I got to the cost function. <laughs> That's where we were. Okay, and then finally, these actions, this little star down here just tells you how to, to form these currents. And again, I'm not going to go into that. All right. How do you choose the, oh, okay. how do you choose the Chevrolet uh, Z? Uh, this one over here? Yeah. It's another reproducing kernel Hilbert space. And so sometimes it's exactly the same Gaussian that. Gaussian kernel that we use for the other. So that's one of the beautiful things. That was a great question. So basically, we can have all these terms basically in the same framework and everything and, and take advantage of these, these properties, these spaces. Okay, so how much time do I have left? 10? Uh, yeah, I'll give you 10. You started late? Yeah. <laughs> all right, so I'm six minutes behind. <laughs> okay, so the other stuff's just real, real short and everything. So this is my third. Um, cost function, and so this is a 4D lung registration method up here, and so this is a paper by Metz and Wiro Nielsen and some others. So the idea here, it's not as complicated as what we're just going through, so basically it's to, to use a, a B-spline basis not only in space but also in time. So if I have a breathing lung and everything, I can take like maybe 10 phases of the lung, map them along the, the time axis right here, and then these are our, our space um, dimensions over here. And then if you have a periodic motion such as heart beating or lung breathing and everything, we can actually wrap the, um, the basis around on itself just by adjusting the neighborhoods. So here's the idea. The basis is just a, a cubic B-spline, and in the paper it's more general, but I'm trying to simplify things here. So we're going to have basically this space and time transformation, so it's not just space anymore. And so think of T as just the, the index of your um, images. We have our cubic B-spline basis functions over here, and then we have some coefficients over here. And I expanded it out because I wanted to show you that there's a zero for the last component on the, um, on the, the coefficients up here. And that's to ensure there's no temporal deformation. So you can only have deformation along the spatial coordinates, but it's correlated between each one. But I, I'm not going to deform the grid in and out of time. Okay, so that, that's what the zero is doing. So I'm going to estimate these parameters up here, and then the standard B-spline basis from Daniel Rickert's paper. Okay, so now the next thing we're going to do is we're going to define a d-dimensional image, I of y, and so in this case it's going to be a three plus one-dimensional image, and so basically you just take the, the three-dimensional spatial coordinates with the time, and so now we have this like space cross time index, this is just another way of writing the basis from the previous equation up there, and I'm just going to skip through this because I just said all this on the previous slide. So, Okay, so then the way the cyclic motion happens, like I said, is you just modify the neighborhood so it goes around in, in a circle. And so this is the cost function here. So I got here much faster this time. <laughs> okay, so what it says to do is it takes this four-dimensional image with this four-dimensional transformation, and basically it's going to register it to an average image, okay? And so it's better to look at it with a picture up here. So here's my average image. Each one of these around the horn up here is basically the different indexes of time. And basically what we're trying to do is find the, the mean image right here. And so the idea behind this registration is you just directly minimize this. There's no target image. You actually, as you iterate, um, try to find this mean image. And like sometimes it doesn't work very well because if they're really misregistered to begin with, you just get this blurry mess as your average down here. And so it's got to be close to, to alignment before this is going to work. So maybe what you want to do is just pick one of your images first and match everything to this first image and let it drift towards the center, your average up here. Okay, so, okay, and then, then one more constraint. We want this to, to end up in the center, so we just make sure that the average transformation is the identity. Okay, so then, um, Real quick, I didn't have that many slides. Yeah. Um, I understand that if you have smooth asymmetry, spatial space, yep. uh, no folding, no zero carrying, it's, it's fine. But yep. what, why is that required in the temporal space too? Okay, so, 
so they didn't put the smoothing on the temporal space, they parameterized it so what, anything that happens in one uh, time slice affects the, the adjacent time slices. So it, it's basically setting up a correlation. So you're not going to have, like if your images are, are basically acquired, it's very difficult to get uniform sampled um, slices. And so basically we're just going to try to get this smooth transformation so as things go through the breathing cycle, we don't have any jumps and everything. And so that's why it's important to Yep. Well, this is just making sure it's smooth, a smooth progression through time and everything. So, I mean, we just don't want it to be jumpy. We, we don't want it to be like big, small, because you know when you breathe, things don't change that much. It always like nice, smooth, even um, breathing and everything. So, I don't know if I'm answering your question. Okay. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. So, in the very first application, when we had the um, data sets over the six or seven weeks, we get two cone, cone beam CT images a week, and so then we would have like fourteen to fifteen images, and so we're we're using this in in temporal, and then then you wouldn't have the cyclic boundary conditions. It would just go in time. And so that's what we're using for that. We're also using it for some image reconstruction ideas as well, back, back projection stuff. All right, so just real quick, I only had like three or four more slides left. Um, so what do we do once we get these uh, transformations? Okay, so we have uh, an, an original undeformed configuration, then, then it goes under some deformation. And so we have this transformation phi, and if I take the, the gradient of that, I get F, which is just the Jacobian matrix. I can take the, the determinant of the Jacobian and get these Jacobian maps. And what, what I'm showing on the left is the transformation from inhalation to exhalation. Okay, that's this guy over here. And then going in the opposite direction is shown over here. And this actually gets back to the question about the vessels not expanding over time. And what you see right here is the vessels. Okay, the vessels are not expanding with the lung. As the lung increases and everything, it basically stays at the identity. Okay, so th there's not very much motion right there. And the other thing you see is this gradient from dorsal to ventral. So dorsals in back, ventrals in front. Okay, and then um, the colors just tell us expansion and contraction. And so what this shows us is if we take these slabs, like this is a person laying on the table, and we just look at this um, for six different subjects, it shows you that the lung doesn't expand the same, and it's kind of shocking. This is true, um, that it actually expands more where you're you're laying on the table. Wouldn't you think, if you're laying on the table, that the, um, your ventral side would expand more? But this is apparently how, how the lung works. I'm still kind of shocked. Because uh, <laughs> you would expect more expansion where it's freer, right? You're kind of constrained by the, the table. What's that? It has good lubrication um, in the pleura. Yep. And the other thing is, if you, so normally people get image on their back, but you can also get image prone, which means you're laying on your stomach. And if you do that, this curve changes to flat. So we've done some studies with both supine on your back and prone on your belly and everything, and we get these, what we expect. The other thing we can do is we can take a mechanical analysis of, of the transformations. And so again, we're gonna infer mechanical properties from the images. And so we can have a linear strain tensor up here, take its, um, and it's defined in terms of the uh, gradient of the displacement field. And then I can plot the magnitude, oh, I'm sorry, then take the uh, signal value decomposition of this linear strain tensor or the Cauchy Green tensor, whatever you want to do. This is just the, the linear tensor. And then the, this image over here, you just pick out the largest magnitude one. And over here, the eigenvalues of this matrix are the direction, so you can see where it's flowing. And then the you can also do other statistics like this anisotropic deformation index. And so basically what this does is it takes one plus the, the largest eigenvector from that strain tensor over one plus the minimum one. If this is an isotropic expansion, everything's going in the same direction, this is gonna be close to one. If it's anisotropic, such as sliding between the lobes, then it's gonna to go to this magenta color. And so one of the things you can see from our analysis is we can actually find where the, the lobes are sliding against each other. So this is Actually, using this ADI measure right here, you can see it's picking up where the fissures are uh, between the lobes 
and everything. So that's just some of the things you can do with the registration. And this is my second to last slide. It just shows you the different information you get, like looking at the Jacobian. Jacobian is just telling you expansion, contraction locally. The maximal principal strains just tells you how much in one direction things are going. Like, and then over here, it's like how um, pancake-like or how, or how spherical versus how rod-like the, the motion is. And so I didn't do all this by myself, so I just wanted to thank my collaborators. And so thank you. So I just have a little question. Yeah. I didn't quite explain that um, current thing. Could you explain it again? <laughs> <laughs> Sure, but over a beer. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay. Uh, okay. Uh, on the previous slide, yep. what are the holes? Is it uh, vessels or those are, air, those are airways? Airways. Okay. Thanks. Uh, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Big one's the heart. Um. Thanks for a really great talk. Just one comment and one question. Yep. Comment was uh, maybe that laying on the back and chest expansion explains uh, the opera singers recording on their back, maybe. Uh -huh. uh -huh. um, the question was regarding the the, um, the kernel, reproducing kernels. Um, yep. Do you need to normalize or control for the, the sampling and the size of the momentum vectors Very, to conserve? Yeah. Very good question. So the, the question is like if I have a long segment versus a, a short segment, do I need to compensate for that? And the answer is yes. So like if I had two line segments and I had a unit tangent vector and everything, and then I instead re represent it by a single line segment, then I would just normalize the, the tangent vector by double. So basically it would be represented by a point in the middle and I would so basically, if I had a bigger triangle on the surface, I would normalize the, the normal, the magnitude of the normal by the, the area of the uh, triangle and the, the line, it would just be the length of the, the line. Good question, yeah. Yeah, so I have two questions. One is technical and one is high level. I mean, from what I know, that the current, current systems in radiotherapy, they cannot support real-time adjustment. Uh -huh. So I mean, even if we're able to register things and we can do it real-time, still there is no way of actually guiding uh, radiation. Well, well, there's two parts to it. So there's a real-time component and there's this uh, scale of days. And so over a six or seven week okay. treatment, we can... So this is adaptive to the therapy in the sense that you can adjust, the f but you cannot do it on, uh, now you cannot do it real-time. I mean, there's no system. No, we can't do it real-time, but that, that would be nice because you have the collimator uh, leaves coming in and out. And so what real-time would be to track the, the oh, tumor okay. up and down but it wouldn't be to change the, exactly. the plan. And you would have a 4D plan that basically where it was would be how you would do that. But um, yeah, we would want to adjust the plan like maybe halfway okay. through the treatment. Yeah. Okay, and the, and the second question is, I mean, is computational complexity becomes an issue whenever you're talking about uh, especially real-time radiotherapy. Yep. So are these uh, methods, uh, I mean, uh, computationally intensive? Can you imagine them uh, at some point running uh, real-time uh, next to the uh, next to the device and, uh, you know. Yeah. At the moment, the mass conserving uh, integral is not, I mean, it, basically it's over the whole image and everything. But the currents actually has a, a good potential for that because it's a parameterized model. So it, it boils down to just very simple um, inner products of each one of those uh, delta Dirac currents and everything. And so there's not as, as big a dimensionality in that case. Uh, but then you have to interpolate. So as long as you, you're, you take the time up front to get the vessel segmentation and build your current model, then I think it, it's got a potential there. Okay, and there's a last question, which is uh, regulation. Now, actually, the, the choice of the plan is done by a radiotherapist. I mean, he decides yes. what is the dose, uh, what will be the position of the source and everything. So if we go towards this direction, what you can imagine is actually real time, you're gonna have to adjust these kind of things. I don't think we have to adjust the real time other than tracking because... Yeah, but still, once you track, I mean, that means that you either you move the source so it goes to the right direction, that means that you're, you're, you're changing the source position, right? So you're adjusting the, the plan of the therapy. Right, you don't adjust the source, but the, the, the leaves on the collimator change. So basically, I'm trying to do this with my finger, but if you think of the collimator as just a bunch of these lead yes. bars, they come in and out. And so right now we're limited by how fast those can move in and out. And so, but we can plan that ahead of time. So maybe you could take a CT before 
treatment while they're on the table, get this all real time about how it's going to track, and you have a model to begin with. And then once the technology um, gets there that we can actually move the, and they're fine enough, I mean, that's an, another thing, then we can actually plan ahead of time. And then when they're on the, um, the table, and the other thing is, it's really hard to get reproducible breathing patterns. And so what we do in, at Iowa and everything is we actually train them with the audio cues. And so we send them home with this um, sort of um, iPhone with the, the earphones and everything. I was going to say Walkman, but that would have dated me. <laughs> but anyway, it, it has music for when you uh, inhale and exhale. And so it's not just beeps, it actually makes the music go faster and slower. And so, so basically this was originally sold just uh, like zen you out, just like calm you down for uh, high blood pressure and everything. But they found that this is a great way to, to train people. And so the longer you can ha hold the breath and exhale the breath, and the more reproducible, the better this plan is going to be. And so basically we want to get to like just six breaths a minute, kind of just like deep in, deep out. Because then you're not moving as fast. Because the, the faster you move, the harder it is for these collimators to, to track the tumor. So I'm going to follow up. I mean, so how about gating? Why we don't do gating? I mean, so just... Yeah. Well, the problem with gating is you're going to be on the table longer. So what gating is, is basically you're, you're looking at the EKG or you're, you're looking at a pressure belt and you only treat when the tumor is in the, um, at a certain place, so like at full exhale, let's say. And so that's going to take like 10 times longer than if you could do it continuously throughout the whole time. So I mean, it's all, it's a business. We want to get as many people treated as possible and have fewer machines to do this. The last, last question, yeah. I mean, is when you are building models, you're building them offline, that means that the, the person is not actually uh, under therapy, is not under radiation. Correct. And then you expect uh, that uh, he's going to have the same respiratory cycle while he knows that he's lying on a bed and there's radiation coming from all over. Yeah. Is well, this a realistic assumption? Well, that's why we have the training with the music. And so they train for three weeks to like breathe to this music and everything. And then we can get some real time cone, cone beam CT while they're actually on like portal films and everything and see if they're actually doing it. But yeah, it's a danger. And so, I mean, we're not there yet. This is still way out that we can do this, but that's the goal. where the radiation treatment plan in real time of your breath yes. is going to be refocusing based on you tracking the motion of the tumor? Is that what you were saying? It'll. Because I understood, yeah. I kept thinking you were on the 2% every three day thing, and so then you would keep recreating the plan, but. So we have a, we have a plan once, yeah. but then we do it in 40, so we have a 40 plan, yeah. but now we have to register that plan in real time with how they're breathing. And so there's, like right now, you have to stop treatment, look at the portal film to see if they're, they're yeah. breathing. And it's a really low resolution, not, not great. But yeah. I mean, eventually we're going to get something that allows us real time to, to track um, how they're breathing and synchronize our, our preoperative or pretreatment model with the, the synchronization. So but, but with the pre, but I, I'm, I'm asking about the dynamics, because yeah. I thought you were suggesting it's, it's conceivable that we're going to get to the point where we can we're, we're changing the focus during the motion of the lung, which it means the tumor is moving. That's all dynamical. Yep. Is, it, is that where things are going? That's where, yeah, that's where okay. things are going. Yep. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, just, I wanted to ask, sorry, my question is clinical as well. I do apologize. Um, in, I wanted to ask, the, so if I understand the, the sort of the, the longer time point of, the, of your yes. clinical motivation is to track the changing tumor size as that changes radiologically and adjust the focus of your beam to target that more specifically. Is that correct? To change the, the, the plan. So I mean, over time, we're going to change the plan. So the plan is what the radiotherapist says. If everything was static and fixed, this is how we would So it. you'll change the, both the focus and the dose to, uh, to, yep. to target it, that remaining tumor more effectively. Exactly. So yeah. we'll, up to that point, we're going to estimate how much dose has been given to everything. So compute the cumulative dose, and then what the size is, come up with a new plan at that point. Yeah, so the question is, um, is there good clinical evidence that that is actually, that there, the sort of, the, the visible tumor radiologically corresponds well to sort of tumor activity in the treated area? So in other words, if you readjust the focus of your beam, 
is there good clinical evidence that that reduces mortality by targeting uh, the remaining two more effectively, rather than, say, increasing mortality by not treating latent tumor that isn't radiologically visible. I mean, as, has a manual sort of readjustment of this kind of thing been yeah. done to show that this is clinically? That's a great question because I simplified things just into the tumor volume and everything else. But really, we actually add a margin around the tumor and everything because um, some of that stuff isn't visible on the CT and everything. And so we know histologically that, that the tumor extends out from what we can actually see. So we actually put this imaginary boundary but then the idea would be to shrink that along with the tumor. So we would always have that, that halo around what we can actually see. But you're, you're certainly right. Like, we've never really been able to, to, to do a study like this. So the technology isn't there yet. And so that's what we're hoping to do. We want to tie it to outcome. And so we just, we're not able to do this uh, radio, uh, like replanning and everything throughout the, the system yet. But th that's exactly what we're trying to do is answer that question. Yeah. Um, my comment is it shouldn't be an assumption that treating the, the tumor as it shrinks necessarily is the better outcome. There needs to be clinical evidence to support that. And, and right. there's many cases in medicine where sort of things are common sense and then it turns out to be the exact opposite of what you expect. Yeah. No, definitely the tumor extends beyond where you can see it on the image. So we, we take that into account and put a little safety margin around the outside. Good question. I don't think there are any more questions, are there? So um, I think we'll call it a day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gary.